Sergeant Don Burgett, United States Army, World War II. Folks, Don is one of the original Band of Brothers, A Company, 506 Infantry Parachute Regiment, 101st Airborne Division. He was with 1st Battalion, 2nd Platoon, 2nd Squad, and I'm telling you what, he was a gem to interview. I met him in Maryland, and we had a great um, interview there. It was almost 20 years ago. And uh, Don, like I said, tells a great story, folks, if you know about the Band of Brothers and uh, the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment and the, the stories he tells. He, he landed on D-Day in France, June 6, 1944, fought at the Battle of the Bulge, and incredible battle. He gave me a lot of pictures, how cold it was there, just like the Chosen Reservoir in Korea. You see the snow, it reminded me of Korea when I saw these pictures of the of Battle of the Bulge. But, the last great attempt of Germany, the German army, to try to penetrate the lines and uh, made a bulge in the lines, and that's why they called the Battle of the Barge. It was really the Battle of the Ardennes, the Ardennes Forest. But Don, God bless you. We lost Don. Uh, he was almost 92. He passed away on the same day my mother passed away, March 23rd, 2017. So it's been almost seven years since we lost my mom and Don Burgett. So, just happy to share his story finally on my Voices of History channel. And uh, it was just a great interview. His daughter was there that day. And this, God bless him. Um, I want to thank Tim Beffen from Germany for sponsoring this story. Tim wrote me, he said he wanted to honor a, a veteran from Vietnam or World War II, but he was so grateful for the liberation of his country. So I said, let's do a World War II veteran. And he said, somebody in the Battle of the Bulge, and I thought of Don. So Tim, this is your story, brother. I'm so grateful for you. you. He grew up around Aachen, Germany, and that was not far from where the Battle of the Bulge was fought. German born, just so appreciative. I can tell this young man is so appreciative of our freedoms and of the liberators who liberated his country back in World War II. And the fact that he's living free today because of that. that that's an amazing story itself, Tim. So I say, God bless you, brother. Hope I can work with you again. I've got other Battle of the Bulge stories you might be interested in. And I've made three trips to Normandy myself and uh, visited the German cemetery of Franz Gockel. He was a German soldier on Omaha Beach and you might be interested in his story, Tim. I haven't shared it with anybody yet, but he's featured in my second film on Normandy. And I, in my fifth film, Return to Normandy, where I take my Navy veteran, World War II veteran, Louis Johnson, back to France, and we meet Franz, and it's a great story. So, anyways, God bless you, Tim. Thank you for working with me. Folks, if you'd like to get involved with this work, I encourage you to do so. There's information in the video description, the comment section, and on my website, LarryCabetto.com. I'd be glad to have you aboard and help put these stories out. And my radio station, KBOH Radio, is going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We just entered our second year. And uh, I'm just so grateful that we can continue sharing this. We need to get this into the hands of our kids. I've said that so many times, folks, parents, grandparents, get them the app, share this station, Voices of History Radio with them. In the palm of their hands is living history. Yeah, how can you get any better than that? And especially in this day that we're living when people are trying to erase our history and saying these things didn't happen. Well, yes, they happen. I've got the eyewitnesses. This is a powerful series of stories, so I would encourage you to share Voices of History Radio with your kids, with truck drivers, commuters, moms, dads, young and old. This station is, is great for you. You can hear these stories. I love my station. I listen to it all the time. So I'm going to go. Thank you for watching, listening, sponsoring, sharing these stories, and subscribing to this channel. And I will talk to you again. Enjoy Don's story. It's an amazing story, folks.
like I told you last night, uh, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some things, but we're going to focus on the Battle of the Bulge. Tonight. Okay. Um, just, just some basic information. You're with the 506. Give me the complete rundown, the regiment, the division, company, your rank at the time of D-Day probably, and then uh, your MOS. D-Day? Uh, I was uh, in the 101st Airborne Division, uh, 506 Parachute Regiment. I was in uh, 1st Battalion, Able Company, 2nd Platoon, 2nd Squad. And at that time that we jumped to Normandy, I was in, uh, I was a PFC, Private First Class. Okay. Don, just, I want to, I want you, I've got to talk a little bit about D-Day now. Were you guys marshaled in England getting ready for the, for D-Day? And what, what did you guys know about D-Day before that actually it, it, uh, happened? That was one of the uh, best uh, programs that we've ever had for indoctrinating the men to a mission. We, uh, we were in uh, England, we were a unit, we had trained together long before the uh, D-Day happened. And uh, when it came about, we all knew each other just like brothers, you know. I knew Liddell, I knew the way he walked and so on. But anyway, we um, had uh, trained him. When we finally were called in for the uh, Normandy invasion, we knew it. But we didn't know exactly where the invasion was going to take place yet. But when we got into the marshalling area, they had uh, sand tables that were accurate. They were huge sand tables. Uh, they even had each house that was actually in Normandy in place. A every apple orchard was in place. And uh, almost hourly, uh, they had a wire stretched over the top of the uh, sand table with uh, poles. And almost every hour on the hour, they would bring in the latest aerial photograph. And we, we knew our mission, the 82nd Airborne's mission, uh, the 4th Division's mission, we knew where the underground uh, telephone uh, communication lines were and so on. We knew everything and that the, the one little town, St. Marie du Mont, that the uh, German commander was uh, going steady with a, uh, with a French school teacher and the German commander rode a white horse. So we, we, yeah, we, they, uh, they, they uh, taught us very, very well for that invasion. Was this your first time in combat? Yes, it was. How old were you then? 19. I just, wow. I just turned 19. So t take me into the night of the 5th. I know originally it was supposed to be the 5th, but take me into the, well, you guys jumped uh, before the troops landed, so just give me a little bit of, of that evening well, and the jump. Did, did you, uh, well, actually, we were scheduled to jump on the 5th, okay. and uh, we, we did go to the airfield on the 4th, and it was uh, gale force winds and it rain, and so it, was, uh, it wasn't called off. It was postponed because there was a window uh, which they said they re received... Uh, weather reports from uh, people that we had up in the uh, Arctic, and they sent the reports down that there was a window heading our way. And uh, so on the 5th, we did the same thing as we did on the 4th. We marched out to the plains, and we had our chutes uh, and shoot, uh, parachute bags at the main and reserve. And uh, we had all of our equipment, our uh, M1 rifles, Tommy guns, or whatever you were issued. And, uh, we assembled at the planes that we were supposed to fly out of. They had chalk numbers alongside the door. So if your ch uh, plane was number 23, you walked down the line till you got to 23, and that's your plane. And uh, we started getting ready. The first thing that went on was the parapacks went on the bottom of the plane, on the outside belly. And they're fastened so when the stick would drop, that was one of the jobs of the crew chief. When, say you had 17 men or 18 men when the, when the eighth man passed, uh, that was the center of the stick where he would hit the lever and drop the parachutes from the belly so we would have an equal chance of picking them up on the ground. And uh, so we did, uh, I, at that time I weighed, uh, I was 19 years old and I weighed uh, 140 pounds and I, I carried in uh, 150 pounds of equipment. Yeah. They were pretty well loaded. Tell me the, <clears throat> the, your job with the 101st, what was the purpose of the parachute drops? In, in relation to the troops landing on the beach that morning? The uh, beach landing has been the experience even in uh, uh, Pacific Islands, where like Iwo Jima and so on. Uh, the troops would get onto the uh, beach and they would be uh, logged there. They, they couldn't move. And about the time they all got packed up like seals, then the uh, Japanese would be dropping mortars and artillery shells at them, crossfiring with uh, Nambu machine guns and so on. So when, uh, in this case, in uh, Normandy, we had uh, four exits, and uh, they were exits one, two, three, and four, starting from just about at uh, the estuary of Carentan and running back outward from there. 
And uh, it was one of our jobs was to uh, take hold and secure these exits. So once the beach sandings uh, landed, instead of them getting caught on there where they could be cur uh, slaughtered by mortars and artillery, they would have a roadway off of that beach and go inland. So we could, we could evacuate the beach uh, very quickly and save a lot of lives and also get, uh, make inroads into the inland behind the Germans. Was the jump successful early that morning? I mean, was it the, you guys <clears throat> or who else was 82nd or just 101st? Uh, well, we both jumped. 82nd had their area, which was around St. Mira Glees mm -hmm. on the Mar uh, Maraday River. And, of course, we jumped uh, near Carentan. And to take the uh, four bridges going across uh, the Douve River and the other three, which would take us into Carentan. That would tie, basically taking uh, Carentan then would tie in uh, Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. So that was another one of our objectives that we had to do. And the 82nd had theirs and we had ours, but the jump was uh, successful in a way. But what happened was that the Aircraft and flights went over Normandy. See, so we took off from England, went around the Continental Peninsula, came in from the backside, went over the islands of Jersey and Guernsey. We were heading toward England when we jumped. A lot of people think that we came from England into the beach. We didn't. And uh, so we were going away from the beach when we jumped. And if you jump too late, you land in the English Channel and drowned. So we uh, they, uh, was going across the Continental Peninsula, and we ran into a rain rain clouds and it was raining and the, only the uh, uh, the air the air corps air corps at that time air force now but air corps back in those days uh, only the lead plane in each flight had a uh, directional finder that was equipped for the pathfinders they jumped one hour before us and they set up uh, signal devices on each drop zone which we called DZ so as we were coming in only the lead plane would home in on that, and his other planes in his flight would follow him. Well, we went through the rain cloud, and the planes were flying so close together, this was the only time in the war, uh, history of World War II that the planes flew with their wing lights on because we were flying so close together, 850 planes flying so close together that the pilots at night, the pilots had to have the wing lights to keep from running into each other. Now, when we ran into the rain cloud, the uh, pilots took evasive action. Some went up, some went down, some went right, some left. And it was heavy, very, very heavy artillery, uh, real heavy artillery. I mean, with the, uh, like the, the millimeters, it was like huge cannons and rockets, whatever else they had, and even a light fire. And when the pilots took evasive action, when they went through the rain cloud, came out the other side at night, uh, they, they lost contact with the lead plane. So the, the flights fragmented. That's, that's the reason you hear a lot of static on this about the paratroopers being scattered all over and they blame the Air Corps. Yeah, it wasn't the Air Corps' fault. They're, if I was flying, to be lucky to hit the peninsula. But they, uh, in other words, they did get as close as they could and they did a good job. And uh, I, did, I landed 12 miles from my DZ. But actually, this all in the end worked out for the best because and so if we had landed as an organized army, the Germans are used to this and they have an organized army. Now you're fighting their way. But we scattered all over, so we're fighting as individuals. And the, the average American uh, farm boy, so to speak, is very inventive. So we fought our way in a small guerrilla war, uh, warfare going on. The Germans couldn't cope with it. They didn't know where we were hitting. They'd get a firefight over here and another firefight over there. And so they thought the invasion was coming in like at a dozen different places. So they, they would be shipping troops back and forth, and they didn't know what they were doing. So it actually worked in our advantage. How many troops jumped that night? Because you said <clears throat> 850 planes. I mean, how many how many people actually parachuted out? Well, we uh, we usually in practice and so on, uh, getting ready for this, we dropped uh, 24 men in a plane with two sticks. Uh, one stick is 12 men, so we drop one stick and then the other stick, and we even crisscrossed at one couple of times. We dropped two sticks at the same time, but. Uh, what we did with all the added equipment, ammunition, and so on, we uh, the average plane in Normandy carried about uh, 17 men, plus the parapacks on the on the belly and all our equipment. Like I carried 150 pounds of equipment, and that was average. Were there so, initial casualties from the jump? It's drop itself, or were the Germans waiting for you, or what? 
Well, yes, they were, they were waiting for us. At first, they, they didn't know because they had been waiting like for five years for this invasion. And they kept building up defenses, and suddenly, uh, I don't think they expected the airborne that heavy, and yet, yet again they did because they, there were rumors to the, that effect that we were going to do this. But nothing is a fact until after it happened. So anyway, the Germans were kind of ready. But when it happened, uh, the, the Germans were as surprised as anyone uh, because suddenly the, they looked out on the ocean. There was When the daylight came, there was a 5,000 ship. But uh, six hours before that, we dropped. We dropped way before the beach hangers came in. I dropped at 14 after 1 in the morning. The beach things didn't start until 6.30. So uh, anyway, the, uh, the uh, Germans, when all of a sudden they got to where they could see and all the firefighting going on, uh, what they did is the Americans ran in a uh, uh, flight of bombers first, and they did bomb. And so the Germans, even on the aircraft guns, they figured, well, this is another bombing run. So when, they, when the other planes kept coming, they said, well, it's a big flight of bombers. But suddenly all these, uh, these American paratroopers start rising up out of the hedgerows. So now they knew that what the invasion was on. I'm going to jump in and then we may come back, but um, let's jump <clears throat> ahead to, to late 44. Just a brief overview of the Battle of the Bulge, why it was called that, what was the objective of the Germans, and then your involvement with that. Well, we, we had spent 72 days in Holland. And we finally got out from under Montgomery, and he kept us in there, and he'd wear you down to nothing, which he was doing, war of attrition. And he'd lost the war in the first eight days. So when we got out of uh, Holland, the Netherlands, our equipment was in very bad disrepair. Our machine guns were worn and billet holes through the barrel jackets, tripods, and we'd lost a lot of rifles, and we were worn out too. So we went back for what they call R&R, &R, which is rest, rest and recreation. And the Germans at the same time, when they defeated the uh, English and us in, the, in Holland, they swung their troops around and readied for this uh, big breakthrough that they were going to have coming down through the Schnee Eiffel. The Germans have successfully uh, made invasions in World War I coming through the Schnee Eiffel, down through Belgium, and into France. In fact, most of your battles were in, uh, around Brussels. But anyway, then uh, the Germans uh, did it again, and now the third time they were doing it. And uh, so they came down, and they had a new division set there. It was only been overseas uh, two, two weeks total. So the Germans came in mass with all these Tiger tanks, Panther tanks, uh, self-propelled guns, and they laid it on these new troops, and they, they did break through, and they came in. And it, what their purpose was is coming down, and they were uh, then again trying to break down through and get into the Normandy beach again. And they were coming into the same place like Carentan down, down to the estuary where um, uh, William the Conqueror sailed from there in 1066. So anyway, that was the dividing point. Now, if they could send their massed army down through there and split the uh, uh, British and Canadians away from the Americans and then take uh, Omaha Beach and then again uh, Utah Beach, they could drive us back into the sea and once they knew, they, now they knew our plan and you could never go back again. So they, they, they put everything they had into it. Were we, out, were we outnumbered at that time? I mean, oh yes, yes, very much so. Uh, as it turned out, the, uh, the this, uh, well, what they call the uh, drive that they had coming through there. Uh, was eventually called the Battle of the Bulge because the, the line that they took off from was actually the German border. So now we invaded their land, which they couldn't stand, you know, and you can't stand it across the Holy River, the Rhine River. But now we were in the, on their border, so they jumped off from there, and as they, as they progressed with their attack, their counterattack, it made a big bulge in the, in the lines. It was a dent in our line, but a bulge in their lines. So it became known as the Battle of the Bulge. And this was the largest battle in the history of man. There was more men, uh, civilian, military, Germans, enemy, uh, the Americans and, uh, and the British allies, and with armored, uh, all kind of vehicles, and also the square miles of land. It was bigger than the Battle of Stalingrad. It's the biggest battle ever fought in the history of the world. And that was the, the reason it was. The, 
And we did stop them, yes. We, we, uh, in fact, my division, 101st, was sent up to hold the key roads of, uh, of Bastogne. And there were seven roads went through Bastogne like the spokes of a wagon wheel. And that was a primary place because the Germans had to move their, uh, their weapons through there, their armor, their artillery, and so on, and their food and ammunition and uh, fuel. And they also had to pull their wounded back. And those seven roads, if you look at the Ardennes, it's a bunch of razorback ridges, and there's no way to travel too well. So they had to have Bastogne because it was the key to all the roads coming together and going out together. And uh, our last uh, uh, command, when we went up there, uh, by, our, by our command, they said, uh, orders, I should say, our orders, uh, you will take and hold Bastogne, and there will be no uh, withdrawal, and there will be no surrender. That's how important it was. We would fight to the last man. And, uh, and we'd, uh, the Germans needed it for their success, and we had to hold it for our success. Well, tell me about some of the, the casualties in Bastogne. I mean, you guys were beat up, or did you? Uh... Well, this is, this is uh, why I mentioned before that we uh, had been in Holland so long that when we went, uh, went up to hold Bastogne, we didn't have ammunition. Uh, very little ammunition. Some of the men didn't have weapons. They had no M1 rifles. We had no machine guns. We had some machine guns. Then again, no uh, uh, ammunition. So uh, we had a, uh, when we got there, Lieutenant Rice saw our predicament, and he was with the 10th Armored. And he took his Jeep and went around to all the uh, tanks, what tanks there were there, and there wasn't a whole lot of them. Uh, he, uh, he begged, borrowed, and stole ammunition, grenades, uh, bandoliers for us, uh, 45 ammunition, anything for Tommy guns. And as we walked, he parked his Jeep in the middle of the road, the Hoofalees Road heading towards Noville. And as we walked by on either side, he was handing out bandoliers of ammunition to the men. One of the men in my squad didn't have a rifle, and he had picked up a, a huge stick, and he was hitting it against the ground. And he said, I'm going to have a rifle tonight. And that's the way we went and attack. And we came out of, Bas of uh, Holland, we had uh, wet feet from 72 days behind enemy lines. Our feet were wet, so we had trench foot and everything. Now when we got into Noville on the 19th and a, a major attack going north, uh, the weather dropped to 20 below. So the men with trench foot, a lot of them, their, their feet froze and they still fought. For eight days they fought in 10 to 20 below zero and without overshoes and their, their feet uh, froze, frostbite, gangrene set in, and a lot of our men had uh, their legs amputated after the, after the encirclement of Bastogne was opened by the 4th fourth, uh, fourth Armored. Uh, General Patton was just after Christmas Day. And when it, that happened, they brought medics, and we, our, our uh, hospital was overrun, so we had no doctors, no surgeons, no, no medical. And if you had uh, been had your leg halfway shot off, you needed an amputation. We couldn't do it. They just had to survive or die. But the uh, but the gangrene set in so bad on the frostbite that there was a great many men had their legs amputated after that, and their feet and their toes and their fingers. But we lived out in the, with no overcoats, no gloves, no overshoes at 10 and 20 below zero, 24 hours a day, and no fires. And we were outside in the woods. So why are you not prepared for the cold? Well, we just came out of Holland. So we used 72 days, used up everything, and some of the stuff that we had, even like machine guns and things, we turned into ordnance because ordnance was going to repair our guns, and if they were, uh, couldn't repair them, then we'd get new ones. Yeah. So then the same thing with our clothing. Now they was going around the troops, and you'd have to fill out requisitions. I need an overcoat. I need uh, galoshes. I need uh, underwear. Uh, well, I need wool socks and so on, but now these things in uh, three weeks had not been processed yet. So we went in uh, basically with not enough uh, weapons, n uh, not enough ammunition, and uh, every time we would kill a German, uh, we would crawl out, the men with weapons would crawl out and get the weapon from him, like a 98 Mauser or a Schmeiser bring it back and give it to one of our men who did not have a weapon. And a lot of men went in that battle with just a knife, a trench knife. And uh, this one uh, fellow, I remember him, he had a Schmeiser and he stood up in the middle of us. He kept saying, hey, you guys, it's me, it's me, because we knew a weapon. If you hear a German uh, Mauser 98, you knew it. So any of these guys got him, they'd always say, hey, you're to his buddy. 
it's me, it's me. I got a, I got a, I got a Mauser 98, or I got a Schmeiser. I got this. I, you know, it's, it's me. You know, and in other words, it's not a kraut behind you. It's me. <laughs> so, so anyway, we went in with a great many uh, uh, enemy weapons and uh, our own, what we had of our own. Tell me about some personal combat that you experienced, maybe at Bastogne. Um, any, uh, you know, tell me about the type of fighting was going on. Maybe the tanks, the artillery. <clears throat> small arms fire what was going on in your your job well the first the first attack that we made actually the 501 made the first attack the whole 101st got uh, two bastone on the west side and general mcculloch had them uh, bivouac that first night which uh, was the night of the 18th of december and so they, they bivouacked the 501 the closest and then the 502 the 506 the, uh, i think headquarters company and then the 327th gliders so now when the attack started, 5-1 being up front, McCullough sent them straight east across uh, Bastogne because they knew the Germans were coming in from the east. So the 501 actually hit combat an hour or so before the 506 did. And the 502 was sent to the northwest corner to hold that from any possible encirclement. And we, the 506, uh, when we hit Bastogne, uh, I think it was um, possibly uh, Kennard, uh, Colonel Kennard uh, told the Colonel Sink, he said, uh, of course they called each other by the first name, he said, Colonel Bob, he said, take your regiment north and develop the situation. So we did, we turned on the Hoofalees Road and headed north, and uh, the, uh, a battalion of the 10th Armored had arrived there just four hours ahead of us. And uh, their commander was Major Desabray. And he set up a roadblock. Well, they, the Germans came down in, in force. They hit the roadblock. And of course, the 10th uh, uh, Armored men on the roadblock fired on them. And then they were ordered to, as soon as they fired, to pull back into the uh, town of Noville to make a stand inside the, the city. And as it turned out, it was General Peeper. Where the, that's the way the Germans pronounce his name. We, we always call him General Piper, but his name, uh, they pronounce General Peeper came down with, the, with an entire second panzer, SS panzer, army. Not a battalion, not a regiment, not a division. He had an entire army, just like Patton's third army. He came down with that army, and we hit the brunt of it in Noville. And uh, we were ordered in the attack. Said, well, here comes these Germans. We heard all the shooting. We joined the 10th Armor. In fact, they stayed in the town of Noville to hold that. And they had uh, 15 Sherman tanks. And we went uh, up the hill into these, uh, they said, fixed bayonets. So we went up the hill. And I counted 32 German tanks coming down the hill. And you, when you run into a, a bunch of tanks with a rifle, you're on the losing end. And uh, a fog suddenly settled in. And this fog didn't blow in, like uh, move from side to side with a wind or anything. It was strange. It would, uh, a whole section of fog would rise straight up in the air, like in a column. And then it would come down, and all of a sudden, when one column would, of fog would go up there, that would set maybe 10, 12, 30 tanks, panthers, a couple of tigers. And then the, the fog would come back down, and there would be infantry with them, what they call grenadiers. And we went into them and attacked and at times we were holding our fingers like this. Fingers at the muzzle in and we went into the fog and if you touch somebody you pull the trigger because the only ones in front of us was the enemy. And that's the way we fought. And uh, we tried to get rocks to stick in between the bogey wheels of the tanks to lock them there. And later get some uh, gasoline from a wrecked Jeep or something and set them on fire because we had nothing to really fight with them. But I think we had one or two bazookas. and. Uh, in fact, yeah, Vetlin knocked out two German tanks with a bazooka in the fog. He went forward and he felt the tank and he put the bazooka on it. And he backed up and when he got enough to be safe, he pulled the trigger. and He knocked out two German tanks in the fog. But that's what saved us. But still in all, when we made that attack up the hill and into those Germans and the, and the Grenadiers, we had uh, almost 100, with the replacements, we had almost 160 men in Able Company. And uh, after four and a half hours after we were forced back down into town, uh, we had 58 men left. And that's, then we lost a few men every day for, since then. After, in fact, it was on the 22nd, we lost eight men. So we ended up with 50 men. 
out of how many? 160. Mm -hmm. In four and four and a half hours, we went from 160 men to 58. So it was it was bitter battling, and the cold was uh, very bitter. It was 10, got down to 10 below. I don't think it ever hit 20 below again, but it got down 10, 15 below, and 10 above. But it was cold. And, and yourself, tell me about some friends possibly you lost there. I mean, you, you were you with them at the time, or what happened? oh yeah, what happened? Yeah, we're all together. And, but when uh, there, if a man gets wounded, you cannot stop to help him, because if you stop, then some German's going to. He only needs. The average rifleman, German or American, needs four seconds to see a target, bring his weapon to bear, aim, and touch it off. So you got four seconds to live. And uh, so anyway, when we went in the attack, you keep that in mind. Even if you're running, as you take off, you're running and everybody's shooting and you count. You, you want to get behind a rock or a corner of a building, you start running, you count. 1,000, 2,000, hit the ground, roll, roll, roll. because about the time, many times I hit the ground, I heard crack, bullet went by my head. Had I stayed up one more second, I'd have been gone. You learn these little things and you stay alive. And uh, another thing is when you hear a machine gun, you can hear the bullets. They crack like a 22 when they go by your head. You can hear crack. And as you're going to the ground, you listen and you can hear broom. That's the gun firing. Sound is slower than the bullet. So if you count, you can say, well, that gun, if it's a sunny day or you know, a clear day without fog, you can say, well, that gun's out there from that. He's over in that direction. Crack. Broom. He's 300 yards. And if I was setting him up, up a machine gun, he'd be right there. So then you call for your mortar man. Hey, Thomas, he was our mortar man in Jackson, say, put, put a round over there. So you've got to do these things to live and to win. It's all the little tricks that you learn that uh, this isn't in the manuals either. So it's what you learn, and a lot of farm boys too, you know, they, and even as a hunter, I used, used to, when I was 12 years old, I was trapping muskrat. And I had a, a single shot, 20-gauge uh, Stevens shotgun, and I heard something behind me go, Frup! right away I knew it was a partridge, I knew it was a pheasant, I knew what it was, and as I turned, I cocked the hammer back on the gun and I looked if it was a rooster I killed it and it was a hen I let it go and that's the same thing when we we made it our second battle into uh, oh I was gonna I should tell you about the other thing too when we withdrew from Noville um, but anyway I knew in that instant so as I turned I, I knew it was a German I knew I could pull the hammer back and now when you know, when I saw him it bang and I had maybe I had two seconds on him and also, most of the guys that came from the city that didn't have this luxury of hunting for a living, uh, they, were, they were maybe a second slow. We lost a lot of city boys. And anyway, we had uh, the next day on uh, December the 20th from, the, from that uh, attack that we made, which killed a lot of our men and wounded a bunch, we were ordered to withdraw from Noville. It was not doing us any good, and we were just going to kill the rest of us. So we, but the Germans, in the meantime, had surrounded us. And so we had to shoot our way out, and we were shooting uh, Germans, uh, like I said, put your finger on your rifle and touch them and pull the trigger. So we were shooting Germans from like two feet away all the way up to maybe 12 feet. That's about furthest we were shooting, but they were there and we were there. We was on a single road. We shot our way out of uh, Bastogne and went southward toward, uh, ba I mean shot our way out, excuse me. We shot our way out of Noville and we were heading south towards Bastogne. And there's a little town on the north end of uh, Bastogne, and this is where the 2nd Battalion, they were in reserve. You always keep one battalion in reserve or one company, whatever. And that was them. In fact, with the famous Easy Company, they, they, hadn't, they, they wasn't in battle yet for this particular deal. They were staying in barns and things. But anyhow, we went back there, and, they, and then they uh, put us on the railroad, and we, we dug in up there, and so we were on the line because they were still in reserve, and we were still line troops. And we only had 58 men. And then the following day, it was on the 22nd of December, uh, some Germans had come down the railroad track, and the two lines from the 501 had gone from east to west at the railroad track. That's where they ended. And our lines went from west to east. But the two lines didn't come together. So there was a big gap in our lines, like an overbite in your teeth. 
And uh, these Germans came down this railroad track, so they went between the two lines, and later on they discovered their, where the other, by sending patrols out, they discovered and they adjusted the lines. Now we had a solid line around Bastogne. But the Germans were in behind, a whole battalion of them. So they said, well, they, we had to get them out, and they called divisional headquarters, and they said, uh, we, at this same time, they realized how badly that 1st Battalion had been shot up in Noville. So they said, well, put the 1st Battalion in reserve and put 2nd Battalion on the line. So they did. Now they discovered the Germans behind our line. They said, well, who are we going to send after them? They said, send your reserve. So that's us. Now, we just got out of a terrible battle where we were reduced from 160 men down to 58 men. So now we had 58 men, and we had to make the first attack into the Bois Jacques, which is Jack's Woods. And we went north of, um, tw back towards Noville, uh, back towards, uh, yeah, Noville. And we got to where we thought the Germans were in the, uh, the woods, and so we made a right turn and went into them in a skirmish. And my best buddy, we had him out as uh, point man that day, uh, him and uh, Rodriguez. And uh, Spear could see people real clear. And all of a sudden he said, there they are. And I told him all the time, I said, Spear, just shoot. I, go for the ground and, and just pull the trigger. Well, don't aim, just pull the trigger. We'll know that there's an enemy if you shoot. But he always had to have us in there, there, and he tried to point him out where well, he did. And the Germans, about 12 feet in front of him, he didn't see, he shot him through the mouth, killed him. So he was dead before he hit the ground. And so we, we went off in the attack, and there was a lot of close hand-to-hand. -hand. I've seen men, I never did myself. I had the opportunity to kill men with a knife, but I never wanted to. And I was lucky enough to always have enough ammunition. I had a bullet in the chamber, so I never had to uh, kill a man with a knife or bayonet. But I, I, I did shoot uh, several of them that was within arm's length of me. And one man, I remember he came around the tree and he saw me and I had to, had to drop on him immediately before he knew it. And he was a young man, he's about my age, maybe even a little bit younger. And he said, no, he said, no, no, think of my mother. And I pulled the trigger. Because, you know, you're caught up in the thing of war. And, and so we went through there and we, uh, there was 58 of us that wiped out a battalion of Germans. And we lost eight men and we lost uh, Spear, that was Alvarado, Spears, Alvarado, Bilski, and Horn, and there was uh, two others that we lost. But we lost uh, eight men in that particular battle, and the, the six of them were out of my squad. You said you saw some hand-to-hand. -hand. You didn't yourself, but you were saying you saw some? Oh, yeah, I've had hand-to-hand, -hand, but I, I, one of them, I could have killed a man. But I had him down with a knife and a uh, bayonet, but I didn't, I didn't run it home. But... Uh, he was crying like a baby, so I didn't kill him. And I, in fact, I had two of them like that. And yes, I saw one, one of my troopers, uh, he was wrestling, and he, they went down into a large hole. Like, I don't know what the hole was for, like they dug a tree out or something. But, you know, they made a large excavation, and this GI and uh, the German ran, rolled down into the hole. And uh, they were trying to choke each other, and then with this... Uh, American, he finally got, got around and he took his thumb and he gouged in the German's eye. Well, he did, wasn't just play acting like you see in wrestling on television. He gouged the man's eye right out. Of course, the German screamed and thrashed back. Well, in the meantime, I had run up to the hole and I had my 45 out and I shot the German. And that ended the fight. It was just, uh, we've had other fights where they, they were very, very close. I saw one, one GI, he had a German down, and he had his knee in the middle of his back between his shoulder blades, and he grabbed him by the hair and pulled his hair, head back and slit his throat right to the bone. So there was, and when the blood comes out like 10, ten uh, below zero, it steams. You can see it steaming and coming out. But, uh, yeah, we had a lot of hand-to-hand, -hand and it was, uh, we were being reduced again in that fight. And then on Christmas, we had been in there eight days, and, uh, Patton had arrived with the 4th Armored of his 3rd Army that was working on the Siegfried Line. And uh, they, they attacked through a little town called, uh, to the south, uh, south of us, and it was called Asinwa. And they broke through there. And <clears throat> when they broke through, uh, the first man, was his name was Bogus, B-O-G-G-E-S-S. -S. He was lieutenant. He was commander of the tank, the 1st Sherman. 
And all the other tanks were knocked out but his, and he got inside of our lines, and the Germans closed the lines again. Well, the next day, they, uh, the rest of the 4th Armored reattacked at the same place. Of course, now we had one Sherman on the inside, and of course, he's you know, hammering on these guys from the inside. And anyway, they broke through, and when they did, the whole convoy, uh, whole convoy came in, and eventually, uh, I think in the next day or two, they came in with... Um, some clothes and ammunition and food and somebody said, "What did you eat?" And I said, "Sometimes fried snow." <laughs> but, but we no, we had nothing to eat. Sometimes up to three days. And um, well, I got to ask you a question as you're talking. Um, sure. The things you're describing <clears throat> as a young man. I mean, before the war, during, and after. How did this change you? I mean, as a person in the later years. I mean, did this experience change you? Did you become cynical about life, or did you appreciate life more? Or, how did you change through all that? I don't know. I really don't know. In fact, I thought I went through it, and I thought nothing happened to me. But there's two uh, two things that did happen. When I uh, when I came home and was discharged, I'd been through four major campaigns. I was wounded three different times, and I was discharged. I was 20 years old. When I came home, I uh, couldn't vote. I couldn't buy a car and contract. I couldn't buy a beer. I wasn't old enough, and I'd been wounded three times, and. Uh, I didn't feel bitter about that. I said, well, the law is the law, and that's what keeps your country together is the laws. You know, don't run a red light, you know. So anyway, uh, I didn't feel bad about that, and I did, but I didn't know if it had damaged me or not, but I, I had the urge. I couldn't settle down. I couldn't stay on one job. I was restless. I would get a job and uh, at that time, and it's not that I couldn't do the job. It's just that in two or three months, and I was gone. I finally ended up in California, and I took pilot lessons. I bought a plane, an open cockpit, low wing, and I was out in California and I'd fly around and up to Frisco, down to San Diego. And I had a job, had uh, several jobs there, in fact quite a few jobs. Uh, steel mills, well drilling, one thing or another. But I gained a lot of experience. Uh, I have a better education, I think, than people went through college. And uh, when I came back, and I, finally I returned home, I miss Michigan, you know, all the water we have here. Michigan has one-fifth of all the fresh water in the world, so I, I missed it in the fishing. Came back to Michigan. And the other thing is, uh, I finally married and I settled down, quit all that traveling. And then I, I wrote four books uh, on what my experiences. So the, uh, I did my own editing, and I noticed uh, I was thought I was doing writing all right, and I started editing. And I was get, getting around 350 words to the page, and uh, I started checking on it. And when I was uh, writing about our time where we went to town and had a few beers and had a good time or whatever, uh, I would have probably three typos in my writing. And then I got into uh, describing battles like the one I just described to you, the, our attack into the Bois Jacques where Spear was killed. And I noticed I would have 14, 15 typos into per, per page. Let me go back for a second. The, the Ardennes, was that part of the Battle of the Bulge, the fighting there? That is the Battle of the Bulge. Okay, well, describe, mm -hmm. is that a forest? The Ardennes is, is a whole countryside. I mean, there's towns and villages and cities and rivers and lakes and uh, uh, forests. And uh, it's uh, the Ardennes is, it comes through Belgium. And that's where a lot of your uh, World War I was fought, you know, going up through Chateau Terry and, and all those places like that. Yeah, that's, it's a large area. Well, looking back and at the time of the Battle of Bulge, <clears throat> the biggest battle ever fought, put in perspective, if you can, numbers, if you can, American casualties, German casualties, and just, the, I guess, the, the, the outcome of that, that battle. Well, the outcome of the battle, as far as casualties go, uh, we had more casualties. Uh, I did figure it out, per, uh, I guess somebody was better at math than I am. We had a little over in uh, 30 days, 30 days even, not 31 or 29, we had 30 days even. We had a uh, little over 84,000 casualties. And like in Normandy, I think we had 5,000 in one day. And I've seen figures now where we had uh, maybe 3,000 casualties in uh, four years. And we had 5,000 in one day. And we had 80, over, over 84,000 in 30 days. Wounded and killed, missing in action? 
Yes, killed, missing in action, legs blown off. Uh, I, I've seen men with their heads blown off. In fact, one of my best buddies, we used to drink beer together. I had to, his head was blown in half, and I, as, half his head was stuck on a limb. And I had to take, stand up and take my rifle and pull it down, and I opened his shirt, and I tucked the other half of his head inside his shirt and rebought it so it could be buried with him. <clears throat> so this is... Um, what uh, we had, most of our guys in, in our outfit, there was a few 18 years old, like I was 18 years old when I, just before I jumped. And then I became uh, 19, and so this is what we were going through. And most of the guys, I think we had, uh, we may have had one, one or two men that were 25 at the time. But most of our men was 18, 19, 20, to 22. And uh, they were the ones that fought the war. And there's another surprising figure on that too that there was 16 million in World War II service people, including the WACs, and less than one million did all the fighting. That's Army, Navy, Air Corps, Marines, submarines, or anything else, from pole to pole around the equator, the whole world, less than one million men did all the fighting. 15 million men in the service never heard a shot fired. So the, the, the uh, Survivors of battle today are very, very slim. Right now in my company, I, uh, Don Brinsdale is a survivor, and we counted the men, and uh, today we have four men out of the original group. Are these memories fading, Don, or is it like yesterday sometimes? To me, it's, uh, it's like yesterday. It's like today. But the uh, what I'm having a problem with is now is names, but I have... Now, mostly, I can remember a lot of names from 63 years ago. But it, when, if I'm introduced to somebody now at a function, and I can turn around and say hello to the next guy and turn back, I don't know his name. <laughs> you know? I, I, like I tell people, I say, when you, when you hit 82, you know, it's your duty to forget. <laughs> so that's the way I am. And... The, again, the Battle of the Bulge lasted 30 days, approximately, 30 days. For us. Yeah. For us. We were relieved uh, by the 11th Armored, and that was their first time in combat, the 11th Armored. And uh, they relieved us, and also the 17th Airborne came in. And, and But they had been, uh, they was in combat once before, on the, way out on the peninsula. And then they, they came in, and they helped relieve us, and they, they went forward with the attack. There's one uh, man there from uh, Indiana, and he's a uh, recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was after he they relieved us. They went forward, and uh, at one point he he knocked out I think single-handedly three machine gun positions, and uh, then there was a patrol coming up, and he waited till he went by, and then he started shooting from the like Sergeant York from the last man to the forward, and he killed 12 men in a row. So, and he, he uh, almost single-handedly opened a breach in the Germans' lines, so he was a recipient of the Congressional Medal of Honor. We have, uh, we've had quite a few men do things like that. And your rank at the time of the Battle of the Bulge? Uh, Three-stripe sergeant. Yeah, I was so a squad you, leader. Squad leader. So you, uh, you lose men in combat. You just go on. I mean, what, how, do you, how do you process with that? what's happening, death? Um, how, do you, how do you keep it together? Are you were you a praying man? Was it your training that got you through the hard times? Or N no, I'm not a uh, I'm not a re religious person. There may be something out there I don't know, but uh, I'm not a real religious person. Sometimes I pray. I mean, when I like everybody else, when I need it. Well, tell me. About Other otherwise, I go drink beer. <laughs> are, there, are there atheists in the foxhole? You hear? Yes. My brother was a confirmed atheist, and when he was dying, they brought a, a preacher in. He says, get his so-and-so ass out of here. Let me die the way I want to. So there are people who are confirmed, but there's a lot of them claim to be who aren't. They, they secretly pray all the time. Well, when you're a young man, you're in combat, regardless of where you came from, your background, you know, you're faced with a death and life situation. Um, <clears throat> I'm fascinated by by your story and, and how you how you you seemingly were very strong in those moments. Uh, your men are looking probably at, to you for 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 guidance or for leaders for leadership. For leadership, for leadership. Yeah. And uh, but still, you're human. You you see these things. When does it hit you that you just lost half your men? You lost your buddies. I mean, when does it hit you? 
it hits you differently at different times. Like when Spear was killed, we became so close. I, I didn't like him when I first met him. When, he, when they brought him in as a replacement, I didn't like him. I wanted to stay away from him. I told him to stay away from me, but he, he was persistent, and we became very, very good friends. We were more than brothers. When he um, was killed, I, it hurt me so bad I, it, to this day. Yeah, you do feel it. You feel degrees. Uh, some men in your company are not as close. You can have, say, 200, uh, 100 men in a company, 130 men, 160, whatever. It fluctuates. And uh, you can't go to town with everybody. So you have a little uh, group in your own squad, maybe four or five guys that hang out together. You go to town together, you drink beer together, you do whatever together. And you get very, very close, and when one of them get killed, you feel it very, very much. But uh, another guy gets uh, killed in your company, and you know it, but you get, uh, immediately, you get hardened to this, or, or, or you don't survive. And they say, we, finally, we go through an attack, we get to the other side, we dig our foxhole, and they say, oh, did you know so-and-so got killed, and another guy got killed, and another one had his leg blown off. Well, mark them on the, on the roster. Mark them off the roster, whichever. You think Hitler was uh, um, <clears throat> plan that the Battle of Molotov's objective was was to get to Antwerp? Was it and was it a good plan or was it just a, a last desperation attempt to do something? I think I think Hitler <clears throat> <clears throat> I think Hitler had bigger plans than we could ever dream of. He had the only intercontinental ballistic missile in the world with Braun who helped him invent that and build it, and successfully. He could fire a missile from Germany, it would climb 72 miles into the air, come down in London in a one-mile square target. That's, that's pretty good, coming down from 73 to two or three miles. From the movement of the Earth, the wind velocities and directions, and hit a one-square-mile target. And that missile came down at 3,500 miles per hour. So there's no radar could track that. And let's face it, he was probably a month to three months behind having an atomic warhead. Now, if you can visualize, we had to fly our atomic bomb into Japan, to Hiroshima and, and to Nagasaki, and it was a big process. Hitler had hundreds of these V-2 rockets by the time, and all he needed was to tip them with hundreds of nuclear bombs. In one day, New York City would have been gone, Miami Beach would have been gone, uh, England would have been gone, and he didn't even put a pilot in the air. And you couldn't stop him, you couldn't detect him coming in and you couldn't stop him. No, Hitler was aiming for something bigger. He wasn't trying to uh, bluff the Allies, he was going to survive as conqueror of the world. And he believed that up to the very last minute. And that's why he, that's why he went so goofy right at the end, because I had it. You know, I had it. It was right there. Tell me about the German, <coughs> German soldier and then the SS. Well, there was there were SS and there was uh, Hitler Jugend SS. The, uh, there was some SS that was very very young in Normandy, and they would fight, and you could drive them back, and they would come back. They were like a gnat. You could swat them, and they'd still come back, and uh, they wouldn't surrender. You had to kill them. They were young enough that you had to kill them. Uh, you couldn't take one prisoner unless you threw a grenade, knocked him out or something, and he came to as a prisoner. But uh, then you had to watch him. He was raised that way when they burned the books and Hitler took over the schooling and they indoctrinated their brain from the time they were infants up to 12 years old or whatever. And they were, they were Nazis and they were SS. They were the elite. Then we had other Nazis who were older like the, you had the uh, Whitman and so on, who was a, uh, a tank ace, ace of aces. He was better than anything we had. He'd probably taught uh, Patton a few things. At one time, he knocked out 25 Sherman tanks, one tank, he himself, set it up and knocked out 25 Shermans, bam, 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 down the line. He hit the first one on a road that was sloped on one side, hilled on the other, knocked out the first tank, swiveled and knocked out the last tank and drove up behind the slope of the hill and knocked out the other 23. He was a genius. He finally got killed. I think uh, he was struck by a bomb from an aircraft or a rocket and he was killed. 
and his name was Whitman, I think W-I-T-T-M-A-N, and, and he's, I, I saw his grave after the war, in fact, last year. And uh, so they, they, he was SS. Now you have SS that are older, but they, they are dedicated. They're, they're true soldiers. And they're SS, but they're mean. So SS took uh, Grania. They had a special on television about that uh, last year. Some of the 82nd, 101st Airborne, there, was, there wasn't too many of them. There weren't too many. And uh, they uh, set in a place just uh, outside of Carentan, a little town of Grania. And uh, the Germans were crossing at that point, trying to do the same thing to split the Omaha-Utah Beach thing. And we fought those same guys, 17th SS and the 6th Parachute, Hermann Goering Air uh, Parachute. And we made a bayonet, bayonet charge in them. That's where I was wounded twice. But anyway, these guys were, uh, were airborne, they were paratroopers. And they held these Germans off for like four days, three or four days. And they decimated three German battalions. It wasn't very many of them, like 30 or 40 men. And uh, I could be wrong on that figure, so don't quote me on it. But anyway, with the, uh, finally they, they had to pull out. The Germans brought up the SS and so on, and they, and they just, uh, there was no way they had to retire from that little town of Grania. The, uh, they left the wounded in care of the Germans, which, we, which is common in two warring uh, opposing teams, you might say. And uh, usually they, they take care of you. You know, the medics, uh, they will take care of the German wounded we did. And the uh, Germans at times will take care of uh, our wounded. So they, they left the uh, their wounded at the mercy of the Germans because the SS came in. They took our wounded. It was on the uh, floor of a church. And they, um, they bound their hands and feet behind them and they uh, run bayonets through their bodies, killed them. It wasn't quick. I mean, they just... It wasn't like a bayonet thrust. They just killed them, and uh, killed them without mercy. Killed all of them, and they had a habit of doing this. And they had some. They captured some blacks, uh, soldiers who were one five five cannoneers, and they were from the nine sixty ninth uh, black artillery unit. And uh, they tortured those guys for hours. Finally, killed them and left their bodies out in the snow. That was just out of Bastogne. So there's different people, and yet there's some Germans who probably are were possibly farm people, and at the end they were brought, inducted into their military, and they were just like I was. I was, you know, a country boy, and um, we didn't. I never tied anybody up and tortured them. I don't believe in it. I, if somebody needs it, I'll shoot him in a heartbeat. But. Uh, these, there's probably Germans out there. In fact, I've known them. So in fact, one of them was in a little uh, place where 300 British were killed, and we counterattacked, and we killed a lot of these guys. And this man surrendered to me, and he was a Fallschirmjäger, Falsch paratrooper, but he was tall. And usually your paratroopers are short, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, hardly anyone six feet. And he was very tall. He was about six foot two or three. And so since he, he was behind me and he yelled at me several times and I turned out dark and I didn't see him and finally I did see him and he, uh, he surrendered to me. And then he asked me if I wanted a Luger. He had a Luger and a pair of binoculars and, uh, you know, choice, choice souvenirs. But I was carrying a 42 pound machine gun and, you know, box of ammo and I just couldn't carry anymore. It's easier to life. Get rid of the ammo and carry the Luger or get rid of the Luger and carry the ammo and live. So that's the decision I made. So there's, I don't know who got the Luger or the binoculars, but anyway, this German, uh, we got along and so well that I uh, gave him a pack of cigarettes. And it, we got along very well, and I don't believe that, that he had any atrocity in him. Tell me about, we're getting near the end, tell me about the Battle of the Bulge as far as the importance of, of that battle to the ending of the war. Well, what happened there was that the Germans had all the um, faith in the world that they were going to split Omaha Beach. Well, they, they had Tiger tanks, which we knew nothing could compare with that thing. It was a monster. And uh, they, they, a, a Tiger, a, a Sherman tank had to get within three yards, just uh, 300 yards, just to damage a Tiger. A Tiger could kill, destroy a Sherman at 3,000 yards. So it was a one-sided fight. So they had Tigers, they had Panthers, 
And they came down in force, and they were going headed to split the Omaha and New York, Utah Beach. And had they done that, they would have thrown us back into the sea. We could have never recovered before Hitler would have had a nuclear bomb on the end of a rocket. So it would, to Hitler, it was all important. And the other thing was, if there was no nuclear war uh, bombs involved in this thing, had the Germans uh, held all this reserve instead of going into this attack, had they retired to the other side of the Rhine, the German side of the Rhine River. Now you just stop and think about crossing one mile of the Rhine River and facing 3,000 tanks firing at you all the way in. And they had, at this time, they also had the 262, a twin-engine jet fighter plane. And nothing we had could touch it. The P-51 was obsolete when that thing took to the air. We would have been fighting a losing war from that day on. And if, if the Germans had taken all their tanks and their armament and their troops and set them up along the Rhine River on their side and blown their bridges, we might have been five years trying to get to them. Don, tell me about the price for freedom. You saw men die, wounded in battle. Our young people today, you talk to kids in schools, they have no idea why they have what they have. What would you say to a young person about the cost and the price for freedom? I can't describe it. They're, they're everybody, I'll give you an example. When the, when the Pearl Harbor was bombed on, on December 7th, my brother, and all of his buddies who were older than I was took the blankets off their bed. They went to the draft board that night, December 7th, 1941. They rolled up in their blankets on the sidewalk at night, and they slept there. So when the draft board opened the door in the morning, they'd be the first in to volunteer. And we came out of a depression. We had hand-me-down clothes, and we went hungry sometimes for two or three days. That is because the men loved their country, and they fought for it. We had nothing to fight for except our country, love, patriotism. And since then, I've seen people here in this country run off to Canada and then come sneaking back at night, forgiven. No. If I, was, if I had the command of this country, they would never come back. If they did, they'd be on the end of a rope. This country is ours. And I don't like to see people crossing the border. I might be stepping out of line, but I don't like to see them cross the border and I saw one on television just the other day. He said, I have my rights, and he was in this country illegally, and he was complaining about the treatment he was getting. He, they said, how long have you been here? And he had an interpreter said, 10 years. He could not speak a word of the American language in 10 years, and he wants to be American baloney. There's other people. I, I, had, I, I grew up with an Italian kid. His parents, first thing they did was learn our language. Yes, sir. And they, and they all, and all of their children served in our, in our services, Navy, destroyers, infantry. And people in my generation, like I said, they took the blankets from their bed and they fought for their country. And we went into Bastogne with no ammunition and a stick and a knife fighting tanks. And I've seen people here down our country, are some of our biggest uh, people in Hollywood, and even our news commentators, and there's a couple in particular, I'm not going to name them right now, but they are there, and they have no good words. And the first thing they do when they open up their uh, broadcasts for news, they give you a body count. And those people themselves are not Americans, and yet they're making their life living here. No, I'm an American. And if I, if I had the power, they wouldn't be here not too long. Well, you know who I mean. Yeah. <laughs> See, she, she would be gone. I mean, She's, uh, you talk about traitors. We have traitors in, in politics now. Tell me about uh, the, the American flag, what it means and represents to you as a veteran and as an American citizen. Well, I know one politician who voted it down to protect it. And I know of one. I, I think he was one of the primary ones. And he's, he's a representative in Michigan. And um, that flag, it's so many times, like when you see him raise that flag down there in the Pacific and everybody, they, you can't describe the feeling. You either have it or you don't. And you're American or you're not. If you're not, get out. But anyway, they, uh, the flag, 
and there's a certain way to, to uh, fly it. You know, the field is always to the flag's right. And there's a certain way even if you put it on a, on a, uh, over a street. If the uh, street runs east and west, you put the flag facing north of the uh, field. So there's certain ways and there's respect for that flag, and that's why it's on every coffin of some guy that lost his life to protect this country. And he has a flag on his coffin, and that flag is given to the uh, nearest of kin. And I was commander of the Disabled American Veterans for 12 years for Livingston County. And I have presented many, many, many flags. I've presented 77 flags in one year. And, it's, uh, and those flags are kept. They're, they're holy. And that's our country. It's a symbol of our country. It's our country that, it's, that you can take with you. If you, if you go to Russia, the middle of Russia, and you have the flag with you, you have the United States with you. It's America. Um, what should our country remember about World War II? Don't do it again. <laughs> no, it's, war shouldn't be. You know, there's always somebody, if you're backed into a corner, you're forced into war, you have to fight. And if you're gonna fight, the thing that I can't see is some people say, we shouldn't be in Iraq or this place or that. If your country is at war, you're at war. And you're not at war with individuals. They say, well, that was an innocent civilian. How do you know? Somebody's killing our people at night. There's no such thing as an in, uh, innocent civilian because you don't, you cannot fight a war against individuals. Say, that man, I, I'm gonna fight against him, but not him. No, you fight, a country fights a country. In other words, all these countries are patriots and all those countries are enemies. The whole country, to the smallest baby in a cradle. They're, they're, the whole country is, our, that country is our enemy, not an individual. Well, we're just about done. Um, at the end of my interviews, I always ask the veteran to give me a salute into the camera. Can you do that for me <laughs> when I ask you from where you're seated? Seated? Yeah, well, because of the camera. Okay. Okay. If you saw one of my films, you would you would realize the importance Just, of this. I've gained a little weight since that. You don't see it. You don't see it, man. You look really good. Thank you. Just whenever you're ready, Don. Right in. I'm I'm ready. <laughs>